Uh, now it's time for our keynote talk. Uh, so I'm going to be introducing the speaker. Whether through making original digital content for Ted Ed and Wiley and Sons, writing for Science and Forbes, or speaking to live audiences at TEDx and South by Southwest, Mary's goals are the same, make science accessible for all. Mary, a Salzburg Global Fellow and first-generation college student, holds two master's degrees, one in biology and the other in science communication from Imperial College in London. She is the author of Write, Present, Create, Science Communication for Undergraduates, and has taught nearly 20,000 students both in person and online since 2007. Her work has been featured in legacy media outlets such as Time Magazine and National Geographic, as well as garnering views in the millions with YouTube's Mahalo. Mary began her research career in astrophysiology at NASA Ames Research Center Moffett Field in 1999, and now focuses her research on the intersection of fear science, communication, and personal social change as STEM faculty for San Jose State University. So I'd like you all to uh, join me in welcoming Mary Poffenroth. Hello, everyone. Um, I probably should uh, take off that 1999, considering that's like 21 years ago. Ah, oh, no. Okay. Uh, so if you could toss me the host, that would be amazing. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Mary Poffenroth, and um, excellent co-host. Perfect. All right. So um, today we're going to do a little bit of a different style keynote, and I'm going to do some storytelling and we're going to do some skill building. There will be some uh, activity, so hopefully you'll have something to write with or something to type in, um, but there won't be any like breakout sessions because I do want to be really aware that Zoom fatigue is real and it is uh, 3 p.m. for you on the East Coast. And so if you can just kind of like get comfortable, I invite you to have your camera on, but it's definitely not a requirement and we are going to get started. All right, so Everyone is here today because of your love of science goes far beyond the lab or the field. Your love of science goes so deep that you need, you're driven to share it with the world. Everyone here has also found that their love of science cannot usually be sequestered to one discipline or one project. And this deep desire for knowledge, this search for something more in the sciences can sometimes make you feel like you don't have a home. But luckily there's places like this that you find people that are just as multi-passionate as you and you finally feel like you're seen. For me, science and science communication has taken me all over the world and really allowed me to do things completely out of my comfort zone. I remember the first time I put on a wetsuit. Uh, this was at Breakwater Cove in Monterey County, and it was my scuba dive certification dive. And I was doing a certification dive because at one point, I thought for sure I was going to be a marine biologist. Now to be fair, I also was completely sure I was going to be a NASA scientist, a, uh, a sea lion trainer, was totally sure I was also going to be a field mammologist. And if, uh, you know, even though I've done all of these things in my career, none of them really stuck. Some people can consider this uh, unfocused. I just call it a great lover of science communication. So back to me putting on a wetsuit. Uh, there I am, Breakwater Cove. If you've ever been on the coast of Northern California, you know it is not warm. It is really, really cold. So, and at the time, I didn't know enough that to understand that my wetsuit was entirely too small for my body. So there I am, you know, tugging and pulling. And at the time, I was a freshman undergrad. So I'm on this really cold beach, really nervous about getting my open water certif certification. And everyone else is in their wetsuits. And they're all staring at me, waiting for me to sort myself out. Well, it was going about as well as you're probably all imagining. And I feel like 2020 is a lot like that morning on the beach where feeling at the same time stuck as well as things moving way too fast. And the entire world seems like they're watching and waiting for me to get it right. 
So when things feel too chaotic for me, um, that too much is happening, one way that I am able to kind of lean into that wave of chaos and change and not pull back and get small and hide is to really add systems to complex issues and emotions. And that's what we're gonna do together today. Now, for me, I'm a sort of recovering perfectionist, more on the perfectionist side, trying to get more on the recovering side. And if I can't immediately figure something out or if something feels too big and nebulous, then I either procrastinate or I avoid. A lot of times that looks like cleaning my house. And by the way, my house is entirely spotless now. I'm not sure if anyone can relate. Uh, but one of the methods that I use that we're going to talk about today is uh, design thinking. So if you have heard of design thinking or the Stanford D School or IDEO, go ahead and touch your nose for me. And if you haven't, I really, really highly encourage you checking out some of their work. Um, it's really instrumental. And the stuff that we're going to do today is usually used in UX or product design, but I apply it to navigating difficult situations that we're all going through right now. And even in the future, as we progress in our careers, we're absolutely going to still have these challenges. So I'm gonna pop a um, link in the comments section I would like you to start with. So the thing that we are seeing, if you go into the, um, the chat thread, this will take you to a single page that will have a graphic. And you're going to see um, the words empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. I'll give everyone a second to open that up. So this right here is going to be the most basics of design thinking. And the way that I use this and again, you know, your brains might not work this way. This just really helps me to have a framework to put really difficult things um, to hang them on, a little foundation of scaffolding. So these steps that go in order from empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test, and you'll see some little kind of um, notes on the outside of them. Um, this is a framework that was created um, out of the Stanford uh, D School or Design School and really populated by IDEO. So what we're going to do today is really focus on the empathize, define, and ideate stages. And um, I want to briefly talk about prototype and test since we won't get to those. Uh, with the prototype and test, those are going to be the later ones because that's when you are starting to really get into the solution aspect. And these are things that you can use. You can use this framework for absolutely like any problem, any project, um, any piece that you're going to make, especially if it's going to be a really big piece. I know for when I make my own science communication pieces, um, they're on a spectrum. Sometimes there's something simple that I'm going to get off really quickly that's, you know, something like a blog post. And then there's going to be bigger projects that have a really long runway that have a lot of time, attention, uh, hopefully a lot of money behind them to be able to bring in a team and compensate, for them, compensate them for their time and their energy and their expertise. And then these are going to be things that you want to really have a clear pathway on. So let's start with empathize. Um, in this graphic here, it says uh, interviews, shadowing, seek to understand, and non-judgmental. Um, this is going to come back if you were doing something around creating for something outside yourself. But really, when we think about empathize, we're also thinking about the values that either we have ourselves or the values of the person that's going to be the end user of the thing that we're creating. So everyone in the room has come to today with a different love of a different style of media. Um, many of you enjoy the writing. Many of you enjoy video or audio. Uh, many wanna go through all of those depending on what's gonna be really appropriate for um, the project. But really it's about starting with who is that one person that is going to be consuming the media at the end and then working your way back. I heard a little bit about uh, thinking about this in the last talk around, okay, who's, who's your target audience? But I wanna get even more well-defined because when we think about audience, that's still kind of big and broad. And when you create for everybody, you really create for nobody. 
because you want to have a really specific, like one person in mind when you are talking through the lens of a camera, when you are writing a piece, when you are trying to think about a new way of creating a science communication program for school children. Having that one single person allows you to create a communication that is going to be more authentically you and really resonate with a very like, you know, distinct group of people. It's easy to get caught up in the, okay, I wanna make my thing for everybody, but not all humans are going to be the same. So really thinking about what are the values that you have that are important and what are the values of the individual person that you're making this piece of science communication are. You know, for me, one of my big values is educating. Um, educating others allows me to feel like that is the value I contribute to the world, as well as the value that I get from the world. You know, I feel like I've been trying to get people to believe I know stuff, and uh, since I could talk. I was one of those kids that would literally talk from the moment that they got up until they finally passed out at night. And it would only take like a really tidbit, tiny nugget of information for me to spin it into hours and hours of educating people, anyone really who would listen. And when I think back on that, this ability and this desire to educate others allowed me to be told I was smart. And when other people told me I was smart, I felt powerful and I felt in control. And educating others and, and being educated helps to make me personally feel safe. And, and it still does. You know, knowledge, the pursuit of it and the consumption of it and the sharing of it is absolutely one of my core values. And it's the way, one of the ways that I interact with the world. And this is part of what draws me to science communication. And really knowing your own values can help to be that North Star that's gonna guide you when things get really chaotic and it's really tough to move through what's happening and tough decisions need to be made. So I wanna do a little activity. Um, I'm gonna put another hyperlink in the chat thread. And we're gonna just do um, a like three minute activity where uh, I'll send you to a page in just a second. There'll be a list of words, actually like five columns of words, depending on if you're on mobile or a laptop. And what I want you to do is either write down or type um, within this three and a half minute section that we're gonna do, any of the words that really resonate with you as a person. Um, this is just gonna be a values activity. You can come back to this activity when you're thinking about your target audience, but it's a little bit easier right now to do it just for yourself. And one of the things before I, that's why I'm waiting to give you the hyperlink, uh, I want you to just read through the words and don't filter and don't judge which words sound like you. If you read a word and you're like, yes, that's me, or that, you know, uh, is something that I think is important or something I care about or something I want to be something I want to include more of in my life. Maybe it's not there yet, but it's something that I would really love to have in my life. Just either copy and paste it or write it down. Don't judge it because it's in that judging that sometimes we keep ourselves from the big aha moments. So I'm going to pop this into the chat thread and put on a little music while we take three and a half minutes. Um, and if you want to share a couple of your top values into the chat thread, um, I really invite you to do that. Um, I'll do it as well. And I'm going to pop some music on so it's not just weird, quiet, staring at me, although it's super fun. But oh, let's see. All the things to press. All right, let me switch. Awesome, thank you for those that uh, included some of their, um, and continuing to come in on um, the ones that, you know, their top three that resonated with them. And a lot of overlap. Um, and it'll be interesting to kind of look back and see if any of these words 
were surprising or maybe something that kind of, oh, hey, I want more of that in my life. Um, that maybe it's, it's been something that you haven't really paid a lot of attention to because uh, hashtag 2020 uh, and that you want to kind of get back to. And what I really encourage you to do is have a list of these values that are going to be important to you and put it somewhere really visible in your house or your workspace. Um, I have a huge like pin board that I put stuff on that are both like memories of good things that I've kind of collected random bits and bobbles, um, but also things that help to remind me why I'm working 14 hour days and why uh, I'm making myself sit down and, and write a piece. And you know, there's this famous quote, the thing I love about writing is already having written, right? It's uh, the writing process can be sometimes really difficult and having these values front and center helps you have a visible, a visceral way of reminding what you're really fighting for when you're creating science communication. So if we go back to um, the other um, website that I showed you with the design thinking, and I'll repopulate that so it is up front and center. Let me just get the URL. So on that second stage, um, we're going to have define. So, you know, these are all really loosely interpreted, interpreted, it's not really a word, uh, interpreted of having wiggle room on purpose. So this framework is to not constrain you, but to give you a scaffolding to build upon. So with define, for us, what we're going to do today is think about purpose. If you are doing a sitcom piece, um, let's say someone has hired you to do this piece, whatever your strengths are, if you are doing video or audio or written, you want to start before you begin on the piece of, of what's the purpose, what's the, what's the bigger why other than I'm getting paid for it. And the bigger why is important to start with because I know for me, uh, I jump into, if I don't like reel myself back, I will jump into the things that I like most about creating and not necessarily think about the entire purpose or the drive behind the piece. So I might jump right into the details or into the science or uh, thinking about how to design the set. But that is really kind of just serving me and my desires. And even though through science communication, the science is getting filtered through our personal lens, thinking about the overarching purpose of the piece, as well as our overarching purpose as communicators can really be essential. And the next little activity we're gonna do is coming back to our purpose. Um, as everyone is going through navigating their careers, you're going to be given opportunities that maybe you should say no to. Um, early on, I know that for me, saying no was really hard because I wanted to say yes to everything. And the problem with saying yes to everything, not only are you going to burn yourself out, is that not everything people will want you to do in science communication is going to align with your values and in line with your purpose. But if you don't have real good clarity on what your values are and what your overarching purpose is, then sometimes you can make decisions to do a science communication piece that maybe isn't so aligned. And that has to be a personal decision. But having this in a very concrete way, a very visible way can help you make those decisions of whether you should take a piece or not. Because in science communication, for the most part, unless you're just part of a bigger team that's creating a product, your name is associated with every piece you make. And those pieces will follow you throughout your career to build your larger personal brand. And personal branding in the current age is really a reflection of who you are, what you value, and what your purpose is. So for this, we're going to have this definition as, as a purpose. And since we all are going to have very different communication pieces that we're going to be making immediately and, and down the road, I want to do a little bit around our own purpose. So with this activity, um, we're going to do another like three and a half minutes um, 
to have some time to like think about it. And then if you want to share in the chat thread, that would be great. And I'll share with mine um, after we're done. But for this, I want you to think back on the past projects that you've done like your entire life. Um, it doesn't have to be professional. It can be personal and professional types of things, but pick like one or two projects that really stand out for you as projects that really make you feel good when you think about them. You look back and you just know that if you could get paid to do that thing forever, you would just be so happy and you know that you could contribute in the way that's important to you. And I want you to get really detailed about it. So uh, this one project, uh, you know, who was there? What were you doing? Who were you working with? Um, you know, what, what were you serving? What kind of things were you doing specifically in that moment that made you think back on that project as such a positive experience? So go ahead and take some time to do that. I'm going to put on a little music and then we will come back in three and a half minutes. So just to touch on, and if you haven't had a chance to uh, pop yours into the chat thread or, or take a look at some of them, uh, just, I mean, pure gold. Uh, one of the things that I invite everyone to do, as well as what I'm going to do just in the chat thread here is, you know, see if you can find themes across the things that bring you alive. Um, even just in the chat thread, I see a lot of themes of storytelling, um, telling a authentic and funny and humorous story in front of non-scientists. Uh, and that's really what we're all here to do a lot of times as science communicators is be that bridge between the science and, and the research, I'm sorry, the, the public and the research. Um, sharing with underrepresented groups, um, trying to get people excited about science and, and doing some really big stuff here. We have PBS Space Time, um, Explain Yourself, doing um, podcasts, uh, a, lot of, a lot of talks, which talks can be a really powerful way to connect people, but can be uh, a bit nerve wracking sometimes. Um, and being founders of things too. I think when we don't see what we want in terms of the platform, the style, uh, the target audience, we can just create it. We live in a time where we have that ability. And I love to see how many people are, are creating their and founding their own kind of stuff as well. This is so good. Um, you know, I said I was gonna share my, my kind of like big thing project that really resonates and continues to resonate for me um, was when I started teaching I had a knack for really having large classes. And a lot of people in academia don't necessarily love to teach undergrad non-majors. Um, I love undergrad non-majors because like many people in the chat thread, it gives me an opportunity to talk to students that maybe are afraid of science, uh, that think that they don't like science, that maybe at some point in their life, someone told them they weren't good at it. And so now they think, oh, I just gotta take this, stupid science course and get through it. And my goal is always, how do I bring those people from the I hate science camp into at least science doesn't suck camp? It'd be great if I can get them into the science is cool camp, but sometimes it depends where they are on that spectrum. And one of the ways that I've done this is think about how I can make the content that I'm teaching in a very traditional format of a university class more immersive, more visceral. So I started this project that brought university students into uh, Bay Area local environmental organizations where they had to get dirty. They had to um, plant trees, they had to be in tide pools, they had to do um, restoration of marshlands. Uh, you know, not everyone had to do everything, but um, it really culminated in a project that resulted in 4,000 San Jose State University Spartans contributing 16,000 hours to local Bay Area organizations. And this may seem kind of a weird SciComm thing, but it allowed them to communicate in a really visceral way, where they were getting dirty. They were out and making the science real, 
And many of these students had never been outdoors, even though the Bay Area is a very outdoorsy kind of uh, place. And the reactions of having students be able to put the content into a context that is just not possible in the classroom is by far still one of the highlights of my entire career. So when we think about themes, for that, that shows me a theme that I really enjoy things at scale. Um, I like to see a positive impact in, in numbers. Um, that's another thing that brought me to science communication is because I could write a piece, uh, I could write a um, script then then turn it into a video and that would create a legacy that would be able to impact so many more people than I could with just my teaching. And it also tells me that for me, I like to see impact at scale for things that are also values, um, connection, community, environmental sustainability. So all of these things together makes for that project that I keep coming back to is something that's really, really important to me. So I wanna pop in the chat thread before we move on. Collaborative posts. Um, you know, collaboration continues to be such an important aspect and can be really difficult. So I'm glad that you put that as something that you really enjoyed um, because when you collaborate with other humans, that means you have to deal with other humans and they have their own personalities and they have their own ideas of things. Uh, and sometimes that can be really, really difficult. Um, creating safe space and, and having these uh, overlaps of different disciplines and different ideas and not just making it siloed of we're just doing science and we're gonna pretend that science occurs in a vacuum and doesn't have any connection to anything else in the world um, is a very old way of doing things. And I think that going forward, and especially as science communicators, because we're so multi-passionate, we are the ones to be able to bring those different ways of doing things. So thank you everyone for being brave and, and sharing all that in the chat thread. So if we go back to um, our design thinking pathway. Um, we're now on ID8. So ID8 is all about just creating ideas, consuming ideas, and trying to make something new. Um, within this ID8 phase, there's lots and lots of things that you can do. But for us, I want to take a little moment to introduce three of the most influential books uh, for myself. And for me, it took a long time. I come from you know very traditional science background. It took a really long time for me to own the creative badge of honor to call myself a creative, uh, to say that I was creative. And for me, in order to create ideas, I need to consume ideas first. So I'm gonna share the three books that have been really influential, influential in my life. I'm also going to pop them into the chat thread in case any of them are interesting to you. Let me do that first. Okay, so these are my favorite three books. Uh, this one, I'm gonna start with this one. It is such my favorite book, I keep giving it away and I had to go buy one so I could show it on camera yesterday because I, I love this book so much. Uh, so this is The War of Art. It's a relatively short read and For me as a scientist, I always thought that to be an artist was separate. You either were a scientist or you were an artist. That whole like fallacy of left, right brain garbage stuff. And so it was really kind of a, a journey for me to be able to say, okay, like I, I, can be, I can be both. And that's really what science communication is about, I think. Um, so the war of art really goes into how do we get into a creative space? Um, how do we deal with the sensations that come up when, especially if you're a very logical person, when you are posed with creating something out of nothing? When you are looking at that blank page of doom and now you have to write something and that can be really scary. So there's a lot of good um, recommendations on just like the process. Um, and it's really funny, uh, and there's good stories, and it's like, it's a relatively easy read, so this is the first one I would recommend. 
the second one um, is actually I'm going to come back to that one. Um, this one's really good. Don't be such a scientist. And as science communicators, it's easy for us, especially if we're coming back from a really a really traditional science background, to get stuck in the jargon. Um, I think that was I saw as one of the backgrounds. Was it awesome? And jargon, jargon, jargon. Was that was that one of the ones I think? <laughs> and so when if we want to inspire and we want to get people excited about science, we know that throwing jargon at them is not necessarily uh, gonna do it. And when I look back on the big gap between where we are with science in the world with non-scientists and the idea that we shouldn't trust experts and that science sucks. Uh, I think a part of it we have to own as, as scientists because we should have been doing a better job of communicating science all along. And I am so honored to be able to be in the room with everyone here because you know that, I don't have to sell that to you. You know that the future is being able to make science accessible for all. And um, this is a great book. This is a, uh, and Randy Olson, I just, I just realized this reading the back cover. Uh, Randy Olson earned his PhD at Harvard University. So that's exciting. I didn't know that until I just read the back. Uh, but for this, this goes into really science communication at its, at its core um, and navigating that space between making it interesting, telling a good story, being factual and being truthful, but making it something that people actually want to consume. Because no matter how good our science is, if people don't want to consume the media that we are creating, then it's just going to be on the shelf and it's not going to really do that purpose that we want it to do. So this is a really good one. The other one, also a huge favorite and one that I've read more than once. Um, this is by Tom and David Kelly and kind of wrapping up the things that we've talked about with design thinking. You know, creativity can be one of those things that can be really hard for us as adults because probably all of us in the room have at some point been told we're not good at something creative of, oh, you don't know how to draw or that, that song is terrible, maybe you shouldn't sing. Or, uh, you know, for me personally, which is funny that I got into using my voice for a living, uh, when I was young, I had just gotten a like, you know, like one of those like retainer things in and I was probably in third grade and we had a class phone and it rang and we got, whoever was closest got to answer the phone. Like, hi, this is Mrs. Smith's room. And I answered it cause that was like a big deal. Uh, and my teacher, yelled across the classroom, Mary, you're not allowed to answer the phone. You talk funny. And I just remember being so mortified. And, you know, looking back, I'm sure she didn't mean it to be mean, uh, but something so offhand that as an adult, I'm sure she doesn't even remember. But in that moment, I internalized it as, I talk funny? Okay. And it's so easy to have those moments in our life where someone told us that what we did creatively wasn't good enough. And so we just shut down all the creative aspects of ourselves. And for me, science was a way to hide from being creative and feeling emotions. It was great because as a scientist, you're trained not to have emotions. Yes. So excited about that. Uh, but that doesn't allow us to be a fully expressive living human. And creative confidence is that aspect of really towing the line between creativity, science, having both a logical and creative desire to create, and, and what that feels like of the tug and pull and the feeling like you don't really have a home because you're not a traditional artist in the sense of, and maybe you are, but like for me, I'm not a traditional artist and painting or uh, drawing, but I'm an artist with my science, which makes me also not a traditional scientist. And so these three books were huge, huge for me in kind of navigating that really tricky space. And there's some um, resources happening in the chat thread, which I love. Thank you for also sharing your resources. Um, 
I'm going to check these out um, when we get off the call as well. Um, and there's a, ooh, there's a Refining 29 one, excellent, love it. And, and thank you for being so active in the chat thread too. I think that's, if since we can't be in the same room <laughs> together just yet, uh, that is such a welcomed opportunity to be able to share these in real time resources. And as I think about what it's gonna look like when we go back to being IRL, I think it would be really exciting to keep this idea of the chat thread, but even in a live talk where, let's say I'm giving a live talk on stage, but we have a, a shared Google doc that everyone is able to access during the talk. And then just like now, oh, hey, I have a resource. I have a resource. This kind of crowdfunding and experience, I think is something that's gonna be a really positive outcome of having to do fully digital um, events like we're doing now. Um, so I wanna make sure that we have enough time for Q&A. And I want to share one last thing that I'm going to pop on the camera. Hopefully you can like see it. Uh, this is a little card that I got that reads, to live a creative life, you must lose the fear of being wrong. And I got this card when I went to the very first SciComm camp. So I was living in London at the time and SciComm camp was happening in Malibu in California. So I flew back home for this because it was an opportunity to have a three day camp out in the woods with other SciComm nerds. Like I could not turn that down. And that was back in 2016. And I've kept this on my pin board, the one that I talked about earlier, because it's so incredibly true. You know, as, as a science communicator, it feels terrifying to be wrong. And we are the bridges that are going to bridge that gap between the traditional science and research and the public. So by saying yes to SciComm, you have said yes to being trampled on in the name of inspiring people to love science just a little bit more and to bring science into their daily lives just a little bit more. And this is just such a terrifying place to be because it feels so much safer to stay in our labs and stay in the woods. But really, I want to congratulate everyone here today because bravery is the courage to get it wrong, to learn from it and, and do better. Because it's so much better to really learn awkwardly than live a life of graceful ignorance. You know, the, the craft of SciComm is a draft, a redraft, and a redraft process that only gets better with the more you embrace life and, and experiences. So one thing I would really encourage you is don't be afraid to run the data through your personal lens. You know, people will consume your particular media because of you and because of the way that you see the science and you see the world. They will connect to you first and the science second, because you are the translators and the world needs your stories. So, thank you. So now we're gonna do question and answer. Thank you, everyone. Um, and yes, SciCam, uh, SciCom camp is not a thing anymore, which is super sad. Uh, maybe one day it'll come back, but if anyone has had a chance to go, you know how amazing it is. Um, so we open it to questions. Um, or do you wanna do verbal Q&A or chat Q&A, Cheryl? Um, we can do verbal. Um, if you folks wouldn't mind using the raise hand function, I can sort of keep track of who's got a question, maybe kind of. Um, <laughs> uh, I see all of you with your hand up already. Yeah, thanks very much. That was a, that was a great talk. Um, I was interested, one thing you mentioned is that you like doing things that scale. Um, and it does seem, it seems to me a lot of SciComm projects are like often like small groups of enthusiastic people or like one person who's doing like great videos, great writing, that kind of thing. Um, and one thing I've been trying to think about, so I've got a little website that I do um, at my institution. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about how to um, leave it such that it well outlasts me and it's still here in like yes. 10 years time or something, mm -hmm. right? Because then it's gonna, I'm, I'm gonna have way more impact that way by getting, you know, hundreds more people to come through and get involved with it. Um, and I'm just wondering if you had any uh, suggestions, advice for, building things that scale that, that go beyond just the committed energy of one person and yeah. creating structures that last. 
Yeah, absolutely. And this is such a good question. Um, and I invite you as well um, as anyone um, in the room, if you want to connect with me after to have a deeper dive on any of this stuff, I'm happy to, um, you know, have a larger conversation. So, you know, the short answer to that is having the blueprints and the design in mind before you get started um, so that you know exactly what, how is it going to keep that engine driving? Um, the ability for things to have legacy either comes down to something that people just really enjoy and then will continue coming back to it because of the entertainment value, um, either or the utility, something that is done so well that it doesn't matter. It's like evergreen forever because it's showing people how to do an equation. Okay, the equation hasn't changed, but it's done in such a way that people continue to resonate with it. Um, that's one form of legacy. And then the other form of legacy, which I think is maybe what you're talking about more is creating something that will continue to grow and have movement, even though you aren't there to drive the bus, right? Like how do you turn a bus that you're driving into like an auto driving car, right? Um, part of that is funding, <laughs> which in SciComm is always tricky because if there's funding, then that means you always need at least one person to be the champion of it. Um, and that person can change. It can be, um, uh, I didn't catch if you were like in an academic institution or like an R&D or private institution, but having someone that is going to be an, an like institutionalized role, like kind of like, you know, when we have um, an on-campus club, the president changes every um, school year, but it's still a president role that's instituted so that there's someone that's helping to move things along. Um, so I think for you specifically, um, and again, I'm happy to um, have a longer conversation about this. Um, it's really creating, creating that plan first. I think where people get into a space where they create the project and the project kind of dies because they did the one and done is they're not at the beginning, having a plan, how do we create this legacy? How does, how does it keep going? Um, so I think doing that in the beginning, um, and this is also, you know, this is a perfect segue. Um, the idea around design thinking can really help that because it's that framework of, okay, so let's start there and let's, let's really see what works within our specific organization that can make this a longevity thing and not just a flash in the pan project. So that, oh, was it academic? I just saw that. You said you were academic? Yeah. So um, yeah, and academia, which is, is, is my space. I mean, not like my space, the platform, but uh, where I work is, you know, getting, I think, leveraging student excitement around a particular project. Because if students are excited about it and they see the value to them immediately, then other students will want to participate and continue as the students, you know, are graduating out of the university. Um, so really having students not just be the consumers of it, but be the co-creators of it will help to really give them that energy to continue the momentum without you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I'm going to pop my, my email in the chat thread just in case. There we go. Other questions? I see Leslie. Awesome. Um, hi, Mary. Thanks so much. That was a really great talk. I am kind of curious what your take might be on just like it might be a little vague, um, but let's say I'm sure like a lot of people here, they have maybe like a really big idea of something that they want to put together, but it feels like so much that it would be hard to do on your own in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess what would be your advice to kind of like breaking it down to smaller pieces that you can do yourself until it kind of builds up to something mm -hmm. where you might have people be interested to work with you or have that support network so that it can kind of grow in, yeah, in scale in some way? Yeah, um, this is a really great question and it, and it goes for a lot of other things in this space of you always have to start with the thing that you love, um, whatever that is. And if you don't 
have that internal motivation and driver for doing whatever that thing is, you are going to not be able to have the fuel to get it to the space of scalability. Um, so for example, I, I love creating video. It was something that um, I'm self-taught and even though my production skills are very basic, I can do what I need to do. Uh, and you know, I, I started doing video <laughs> like my bio said in 1999, um, a really long time ago where uh, it's kind of a joke where I would, I had DV8 tapes, like tape, like actual tape. Um, and you know, trying to figure out, okay, well, how, how, do, how do I digitize this? How do I learn new things? That was exciting to me. So it, it kept me doing stuff because I enjoyed the puzzle of it and the picking it apart. So if I didn't enjoy it, there's no way I would have been able to continue to create scalable things. Um, so I think starting there, uh, do you have an idea for like when we get specific, do you have like an idea for like the bigger project or kind of just you're rattling around with some loose ideas so far? I think personally, I kind of have just like larger ideas that uh -huh. haven't formed into like a thing yet. Yeah. And that's it, you know, especially if you are, when you get people involved, having clarity is absolutely essential because it can get really messy really quick. And then people, even if they come to the table excited about an idea, if there's not clarity and direction, they go, Ugh, okay, they don't know what they're doing. I'm, walk I'm walking away. And now you've lost that opportunity for people that are excited about the project. So having a bit of clarity before you start bringing people in is really essential. Um, and, you know, in the, like right now, this would be kind of like an ideation phase. Um, around this, you know, some of the things that I really enjoy in the ideation phase, which it sounds like you are right now, um, is uh, like ginormous post-it paper and color stuff. And it sounds like, some of the stuff I do sounds really simple, but it really works. Um, and just, you know, bird vomiting, all of the things that are rattling around your head, um, using post-it notes. Um, if I wasn't attached to the computer, I totally, I, I can see my board right now, <laughs> I would show it to you. Um, but uh, post-it notes have a way of helping to free up space because they're not permanent. Sometimes even just writing a permanent marker on white paper, we're like, mm, but what if it's a bad idea? I know it's very strange, but putting post-it, like writing on a post-it note seems like less of a risk. And so our brains will just relax into letting the ideas flow. Um, another thing I would really highly suggest um, that, I, that I work with too is called Lego Serious Play. And that's a longer conversation. But again, it's getting that hand knowledge, getting the ideas from rattling around in your brain through your hands and into something that is outside of your person so that you can start to really play with those ideas. Um, and, and as well, the you know um, offer also extends if you wanna have a larger conversation about some of your ideas. Um, my email's in the chat thread. I would totally um, be open to doing that. Thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, looks like we've got time for like one more question. Great. Longevity, the perpetual question indeed. <laughs> How do I stay relevant in longevity? I see Drew. Yeah, sure. Um, I think you sort of mentioned this in the beginning. You're talking a bit about procrastination. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's something, if you've, maybe if you figure out ways to sort of overcome sort of the the initial maybe hurdle of starting projects or being able to start um, things. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that at all. If you want to I do. That. Yeah, I have lots of thoughts because like I was saying, you know, when, when you have that perfectionist kind of slant and you find this a lot in sciences <laughs> because we just, that's just, it, you know, self-selects. Uh, if we don't see a clear path, sometimes we just trying to go into our hiding hole. So um, one way, like literally this week that I've started um, playing around with is an app called Freedom. Um, it's called like Freedom App and essentially it locks down, and just the word freedom, uh, it locks down, you, you schedule what you want and um, which devices, but it'll lock down whatever you want and usually most distracting like websites or apps. So I have to force myself <laughs> to do what I said I was going to do. And this is especially true for writing. Um, so for me, if I'm trying to have like a creation session and it's feeling difficult because I said I was going to write for an hour, but that's hard and it's easier to go on Instagram and pretend like I'm actually working when I'm not. Um, this 
I used it, just started using this week. That has been helpful because I can't access anything that's distracting on my devices until that hour expires or whatever you set the parameters. Um, but it, it's, it forces me to do what I said I was going to do. Um, and that has been a really big help just this week. Um, other things that, that I find are helpful is, you know, having those frameworks of when, when I don't feel like there's clarity, when I feel like it's too messy or too nebulous, that's when I shut down and I, I don't want to play. But I know that, that that's where the magic happens. That's where the stuff that, you know, as science communicators, we're saying that we want to create stuff that hasn't existed before. If we all wanted a really linear life, we would be accountants, right? Accounting, super linear. Okay, I go and there's like laws that I have to follow, otherwise I get in trouble and then, you know, clock in and clock out. But we've all signed up for this really unusual existence to live in the gap. And so, um, you know, for me, going back to things that will allow me to support that creative space and, and really defend that creative space. Um, and what I mean by that is sometimes people will discount the time to think. Um, and that's why I'm kind of excited about this new thing, the new tool, is that you do need to give yourself just space that's uninterrupted um, and force yourself to just sit down and let your brain think. And I think that that can be sometimes hard for science-focused people because we want to always be doing. Um, but especially in the beginning part of the project, in that ideation phase, you do need to just let your mind kind of like wander and let things come out of your brain because sometimes we will judge like when we did the, the values activity sometimes we judge our ideas before they're even on a piece of paper <laughs> and we're like oh no that's crap i'm not doing that uh and so doing some of these activities can can definitely help thank you yeah you're welcome uh so if we could all give mary another virtual round of applause uh thank you so much that was an amazing talk um and again mary put her email address in the chat so if you have more questions for her um please continue the conversation great thanks everyone enjoy the rest of the day